Okay, so today we're very fortunate to have uh, David Jazz Myers, who will tell us about a synthetic approach to orbifolds. And as someone who doesn't know what orbifolds are, I'm very much looking forward to finding out. So thanks, David. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, so yeah, thanks, Evan. Thanks, uh, David, and everyone at Topos for having me here. I'm uh, very excited to uh, get to talk a little bit about um, orbifolds and how uh, working in homotopy type theory can give you a very uh, concrete and hands-on uh, uh, way to work with, with them that is concrete in ways that are entirely different from uh, uh, the ordinary ways that we describe or orbifolds, which is usually using a form of charts, and I'll describe that. Um, but I uh, feel totally, so totally but are still is nonetheless something you can really get your hands on and work with calculations and get down to brass tacks. So, um, uh, so the plan of this talk is going to be first, I'm going to try and describe what an orbifold is intuitively and a little bit of what the traditional definition of an orbifold is. Um, and then I'm going to do my brief introduction to homotopy type theory. So if you've seen an introduction to homotopy type theory before, I apologize. This is my uh, nth time giving an introduction to homotopy type theory, but I can never assume that my audience knows it. So I'm, I'm going to keep, uh, keep up the, the introduction. So once we learn what homotopy type theory is in very brief, we'll uh, see the uh, homotopy type theory approach to groups, which is a, a basic rethinking of the concept of group on a fundamental level. Something that is, again, is one of these things that is, is just as concrete as the usual way of working with groups that you might've learned as an undergraduate, um, that is as an algebraic structure, except instead of working with the groups as an abstract algebraic structure that have certain axioms, we're going to work with them as the symmetries of a certain kind of mathematical object. And this is a, a rethinking of the way of doing groups. It's, it gives, it's as powerful a method as the traditional way. You can do anything in either, and, they, and you can pass back and forth from one perspective to the other. But when we do groups in homotopy type theory like this, we can take quotients of group actions without using any kind of co-limit or, or equivalence class construction. And that's going to be really cool because that's going to give us a very concrete way to define orbifolds by just defining their points. Um, and this will be a little different than, uh, than how, how we have to do it in traditional foundations. So uh, after that, I'll, I'll do this to give you a few examples of some form of folds to, just to give a, a taste of, of what these kinds of things um, can be. And then uh, I will take some time to talk about the uh, homotopy uh, types of orbifolds. So this is a, a very brief one slide intro to the homotopy theory of orbifolds. Um, and, uh, and so I'll calculate the homotopy type of the moduli stack of elliptic curves over the complex numbers. I'll calculate what that is for you. And then at the, at the end, we're going to finally come to actually what is in some sense the core of the talk, which is the differential geometry of orbifold. So I'll briefly describe how um, using synthetic differential geometry, we can take these definitions of orbifolds that are very, uh, very point-wise, very direct in homotopy type theory and show that they have the correct smooth structure. All right. Oh, and if you ever get bored watching this, or if you're watching along at home or whatever it is, uh, if you want to peruse something, you can check out the uh, paper at that archive. Uh, uh, it's not a link, but at that archive number right there. All right. So to get the idea of, a, of an orbifold, I want to tell you about a, a, an example of one. And so imagine we have a billiard table, and we're going to think of our billiard balls as these point particles. And we're going to imagine that they make elastic collisions with the boundary of the billiard table. And what that means is they're going to bounce off perfectly. The angle of incidence is going to equal the angle of reflection, et cetera. So if you look around a little bit of a ball on this table, you'll see that we have the tangent space, which is the space of possible directions that that ball can flow. So on the interior on, of this billiard table, this is going to be what we call a manifold because it's something that who, which whose tangent spaces are in this case planes, but they locally at the infinitesimal level, when we look just around 
a point. We look at the directions it can go in. It looks like Euclidean space. So you can take a displacement in Euclidean space and you can hit the ball with that displacement and it will go in that way. And that's sort of the idea of this. So this would be a manifold, except at the boundary. Because at the boundary, what we have is a little issue. When the ball goes into the boundary, it's going straight out of the table. But we know that it's going to actually bounce back into the table at an equal angle, right? Um, and so which way is it really going? So one way you could model this is you could say that there's a discontinuity in the directions of this path. The, 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 the direction that this takes makes a jump. And if you were modeling this as a trajectory that this ball is taking on a subset of Euclidean space, then that's what you would have to do. But that kind of breaks a lot of things because once you have discontinuities, you lose a lot of your theorems that are really nice about manifolds. Um, and so if we don't do that, what, what could we say about this, right? Well, one thing we could say is that, in fact, uh, we should consider these directions as being really the same, right? Because if the ball is going out at direction B1, then we know it must actually reflect in at direction B2. So this suggests that we could take the tangent space at this point to not be a half, a half uh, Euclidean space, which has no, no vector space structure. It's kind of be hard to work with but instead take it as this full plane, but where we quotient by this reflection over. However, there's a problem with doing that as well, because if you take a vector space, right, and you take and you set equal these two different directions, you're no longer going to get a vector space. You, so you can imagine that you're going to get something that now looks again like a half space because we just folded it over. So we haven't really solved anything. Here. So the trick we can do is this. We can say that instead of making those two directions equal simpliciter, what we're going to do is we're going to record the symmetry that, the, that relates them out on the point of the space here itself, on the point of the billiard table. So at this point of the boundary, we're going to record the fact that there is a reflection. And we're going to record this as a symmetry of the point P. And I've used this equal sign here. Um, to uh, refer to a self-identification of the point P or a symmetry of the point P. And that's the, that's the way it will be written in homotopy type theory. So that's the sense in which this is a way that P equals itself. Um, and then what we can say is that, okay, this symmetry of P is going to act on the space of directions. And that action is going to be called reflection. And then we say that relative to that action or representation, um, on the tangent space at this point, which is now a full two-dimensional tangent space, that reflection will take V1 to V2. So we're going to, uh, we're going to take this, uh, this situation here um, and uh, uh, where we want to take this sort of, we want to equalize these two things, but we're going to remember why we're equalizing them. And we're equalizing them because the ball will reflect off this point. So this billiard table is an example of an orbifold. And an orbifold uh, can be described intuitively as a smooth space where the points have uh, finite symmetries. So uh, an example of this is the billiards table. So the points on the boundary have a C2 symmetry of reflection and the points at the corner would have a more little, slightly more complicated symmetry, right? Um, another example is what is sometimes called a rotating cusp. And this is if you take the plane and you quotient out by the symmetry of rotation around a fixed point, then that point is fixed. And you can remember how many times it was folded over itself. And so you can attach that symmetry to that point. And then another example we'll see is the uh, moduli stack of elliptic curves over the complex numbers, um, M11. And this is a, uh, an orbifold where every point has a symmetry. Sometimes people sort of divide by two and don't do this, but I'm, I'm going to consider the one where every point has a symmetry. Um, and uh, there are two points of exceptional symmetry. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to those again. So a good orbifold, and this is actually the terminology. I didn't make this up. It's not my fault. Don't blame me. But a good orbifold is the homotopy quotient or weak quotient of a smooth space or manifold uh, by the action of a discrete group 
um, whose stabilizers are all finite, whose stabilizer groups are all finite. So this is sometimes it's called a proper discontinuous action of a discrete group. Um, so for example, the rotating cusps are good orbifolds. And also the, uh, the moduli stack of elliptic curves is a good orbifold because every elliptic curve of the complex numbers is really a torus whose holomorphic structure comes from the quotienting the complex plane by a lattice within it. And these lattices, um, uh, uh, so the two exceptional points correspond to the square lattice and the triangle lattice. Um, and these lattices can be determined uh, 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 uniquely by sort of the, the angle in a way that the, the two of the generators make with each other. Well, not quite. The, 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 the relationship between two generators. So if we put one of the generators at one, in the complex plane, then the other one we can always choose to land somewhere in the upper half plane, and this is that fancy my way of writing math frac h up there is the upper half plane, um, and and anywhere uh, in there is uh, all these points here will generate a lattice when you compare them together with one, and that when you take the quotient of c by that lattice you get an elliptic curve, and that determines a point on this on this space, um, and of course these these lattices have symmetries, and these give us the symmetries. Of, and they have discrete groups of symmetries, so these give us the symmetries of the space. And other examples are orbifolds show up a lot in crystallography because there you have a smooth configuration space, which is sort of divided out by these discrete symmetries. The discrete symmetries are translating, rotating, and shifting through the crystal. Um, this is the intuitive definition, but to do the formal definition, oh, sorry, <laughs> in, in, the, in the intuitive definition, we have the points have finite symmetries, but in set theoretic uh, uh, foundations, points don't have internal symmetries, right? Two points are equal or they're not equal. So there's no way to say that they have internal symmetries on their own. We have to carry that data around separately, which is fine, which is fine. You can totally do that. But if you work in homotopy type theory, you don't have to do that because in homotopy type theory, the points of types can have their own native symmetries. So for example, the, we have a type of all sets. I'm going to ignore size issues for this entire talk, but the size issues in, in type theory are the same as set theory and the solutions are the same. That's the last I'm going to mention of it. But we have a point in the type of all sets, which corresponds to the set containing two elements, zero and one. And if I look at how do I identify this set with itself, there are two ways. I can match zero with itself and one with itself, or I can match zero with one and one with zero. And so I can have these two different self-identifications of this point of some type. And that gives me a group of self-identifications. And this group is Z mod two. And similarly, I could take the, the n-dimensional Euclidean space as a real vector space, right? Which is a point of the type of real vector spaces. And if I look at its symmetries, I'll find that that's GLN, effectively by definition, the general linear group or the automorphisms of RN when considered as a real vector space. And so this is what we're going to do. So let me show you what it is classically, and then I'll show you that we can move to homotopy type theory to sort of get, gain the benefit of these extra points. So when I say that in set theoretic foundations, we have to carry around the information of our symmetries of points, what I mean is that we have to use a groupoid and we have to use a groupoid with smooth structure. So we use a groupoid internal to the category of manifolds, a Lie groupoid. And so uh, I'm going to just suppose we have, this is just going to be a good orbifold version. Suppose we have a, uh, a proper discontinuous action of a discrete group on a manifold. Then we can form what's called the action groupoid. This is also known as the Cayley graph. Um, if you draw it out, of course, everything here is infinite. But if everything was just totally finite, you could actually draw it out and notice that this was the Cayley graph. And it's this groupoid. It's the one whose uh, uh, manifold of objects is the manifold we're acting on, and whose manifold of, uh, of morphisms is uh, pairs of objects uh, together with an element of the group that sends the first to the second. And so, um, if we put all this together, this is this is uh, uh, a groupoid internal to uh, manifolds, and this groupoid has two special features. It is at tall and proper, or it's proper at tall. And uh, so what that means is that the source map here is at tall. It's a local diffeomorphism, and you can see that effectively because there's the group is discrete. Um, and uh, uh, furthermore, the pair the the pairs 
S and T into the take uh, every morphism and send it to its domain and codomain as a pair, that map is proper. And th that's effectively because there's finitely many ways to go from one element to another. So that the, the fibers are fi uh, finite, but really you want this to be topologically aware. So you, what you say is that the inverse image of every compact set is compact. So in particular, the, image, Im the inverse image of a point is a discrete compact set, which is finite. Um, so, uh, so it's a definition slash theorem. It's, a, it's one of these theorems that sets a definition of uh, Mordike and Pronk that uh, all orbifolds, which uh, could be defined uh, in another way due to Satake and then later Thurston um, using charts, are presented by proper et al. groupoids. And that by uh, uh, proper et al. groupoids, I believe are very slightly more general than the, than the other, the, the Satake definition. Um, but we can then turn around and use uh, the uh, uh, Mordek and Pronk uh, theorem as a definition of orbital. So this is the definition I'm going to work with as a proper et al. groupoid. That's the classical one. So the thing about this is that if you want to do maps between these things, it's not just functors. And that's a problem, right? So the, the, the thing is that like in categorical homotopy theory, generally, if you want all maps between these orbifolds, you may have to vibrantly replace first. And so this is a whole thing. The, the, the thing that's going on here is that the points of this orbifold are not its objects when considered as a groupoid. Right? Because the, the points of this orbifold are not really the elements of X, because we should have identified the elements of X that were made, that were, that were passed to another one by uh, elements of the group. We should have quotiented it. We were trying to sort of take a quotient. So um, there's some evilness, if you to speak in, in categorical, you know, moralism. There's some evilness, which is to say there's some equivalence non-invariance going on in this definition. And to resolve that, we have to use the methods of categorical homotopy theory, which are luckily very well developed. However, in homotopy type theory, we can do, we can get away with just having the definition that we started with, the intuitive definition, almost literally translated. So the definition I want to give of an orbifold is that an orbifold is a quote unquote microlinear type whose type of identifications are properly finite. So microlinearity is a standard concept from synthetic differential geometry. It goes back to Bergenon, um, in, I believe in the 70s. And it's, it's sort of the, the, the synthetic differential geometer's right notion of smooth space. So it's, it's, it's the one, if you wanted a smooth space, this is the one that, and you're working in synthetic differential geometry, you'd say, let X be a microlinear space. Um, and so orbifolds will turn out to be microlinear. Um, and proper finiteness is, is uh, uh, going to be just quite technically, it's a discrete subquotient of a finite set. And we'll end up having to work in constructive mathematics where the notion of finite set explodes into a gazillion different kinds, which are all very important subtle distinctions that have to do with topology. So they're, they're not, it's not like, oh no, I now have to keep track of all these different kinds of things, although you might feel that in some moments of pain, um, they all have very important uh, topological uh, meaning. So if I said finite, it would actually imply that a certain map was a covering when it isn't. So that saying something's finite in, inside this internally to this new foundation actually is a much stronger uh, statement. And so this new foundation we're gonna work in is cohesive homotopy type theory. So that's uh, Mike Shulman's cohesion, cohesive type theory. Um, using synthetic differential geometry. So this is the Koch-Lebier axioms together with a lot of axioms from uh, Marco Dunga and uh, uh, Eduardo Buc, who will be here next week. So um, uh, yes, so the, the main theorem, I guess of, of, of that, uh, I'm not really gonna present too much, but the main theorem is that proper et al groupoids are orbifolds in this definition. However, uh, we're now internal to homotopy type theory. So we need to throw in a ton of adjectives that just say, uh, no, I mean the external proper et al groupoids. So the real thing I would say is that the crest completion of a crisp ordinary proper et al pre-groupoid is an orbifold. And this is just a bunch of technical nonsense that really just means that no, the, the, the normal ones that you were already thinking of the proper et al groupoids. Um, okay. Um, 
So now I'm going to go and introduce homotopy type theory, but is there anything, um, any questions about my, uh, my rush job at introducing all the folds so far? I guess I, there's no one in the chat. I, I don't know how to, if this works, so I might just go on. I don't know. Just go on? All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So what's homotopy type theory? Homotopy type theory is, uh, I think, two things in one. First, it's a logical system for working directly with sheaves of homotopy types. So uh, by a homotopy type, I mean a topological space or a simplicial set considered up to homotopy. Um, they present the same theory. Um, and a sheaf of homotopy types, I mean in the sense of uh, Joyal, Lurie, et cetera. Um, uh, so that these form what are called infinity topuses. And uh, every statement that we make in homotopy type theory, it's a logical system. Every statement that we make can be translated formulaically into a statement about sheaves of homotopy types. And in particular, we're going to be working with uh, sheaves on certain kinds of, uh, of, of rings. These are called um, uh, C infinity rings. Really, we're going to be working on the site. It's, it's uh, Dubuque's topos. So it's a uh, 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 germ determined ideals of C infinity rings with a uh, particular um, topology put on them. And we take sheaves valued in homotopy types on these things and we get a certain infinity category. And that is a very structured infinity category so that we can interpret this logical system in there. So every statement we make is a statement about these kinds of sheaves. Now what's very nice is that this is what's called a well-adapted model of synthetic differential geometry, this category of sheaves. And for that reason, manifolds fully faithfully embed in there. And so it will turn out that while we're talking about these things synthetically, and they'll be sort of, uh, it'll, it'll feel like we're not putting any structure on our objects. It will be sort of there for free. We'll, <laughs> we'll have a lot of axioms, but <laughs> we won't have to put a lot of structure on each individual object. Um, we will, in fact, be able to talk about the external, traditional, normal, the things you're used to, manifolds. Um, and our orbifolds will live right alongside them. Um, and secondly, homotopy type theory is a standalone foundation of mathematics that can stand on its own two feet, and that does not have to be interpreted into another foundation to gain meaning. So I actually encourage you to think about the things I say, not in terms of the first explanation as some statements defining uh, the, the determining she, uh, you know, saying things about sheaves of homotopy types on a certain site, because your mind will explode trying to do that translation. Instead, take it at face value. So here's how it works. We say that every mathematical object is a certain type of mathematical object. So we have these, we have types of mathematical objects. So for example, three is a natural number. That statement says that the type of the mathematical object three is the type of natural numbers n, right? We also have the type of real numbers. Uh, we have the type of sets. We have the type of vector spaces. We have the type of types. All of these are mathematical objects, and therefore we have a type of them. And I said I wouldn't say it twice, but I'll say it right here once again. The si size issues do arise in type theory. You don't get away from the size issues. Um, but the same usual things where you think like a hierarchy of universes, blah, 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 they fix the same problem. So I'm just, I'm not going to talk about that, but standard fixes apply. Now, then you also have elements of types. So an element of a type is just a mathematical object that is that type of thing, right? So uh, we use the colon here rather than the membership uh, thing to determine an element of a type. Um, so we, we, will reserve, uh, we will reserve the membership uh, symbol for being an element of a subset, um, which is something that you prove. To be an element of a type is not really something you prove or disprove. It's just something that either you've assumed because by fiat, you say, let X be a topological space. It's, it's not up for debate. You're not gonna like prove that X is or not a topological space when you say, let X be a topological space. You just let it be, right? You're gonna play the game. Um, or you derive it um, and you derive it. And there's, then there's no question about that because it just follows through some simple syntactic calculations. And so um, that gives us the notion of variable elements. So a variable element is, is an element of a type that depends for its definition on some element of some other type. So for example, x squared plus one is a real number, 
given that X is a real number. And so we write this in that form there with that little symbol in the middle, which is called the turnstile. And the back of this, where we say that if X is a real number, that's called the context. And the real power of type theory is the most simple observation that all statements of mathematics should be written with their free variables listed with their types. And it's just a good kind of mental hygiene. And uh, I, for example, teach uh, my undergrads whenever I have the opportunity this, um, regardless of whether or not they're doing anything that needs type theory at all. I teach them, write out your free variables, say what they are, it just helps you think. And this will turn out to be very important when we interpret type theory. And so that's called the context. So the, the main, in, in my mind, the main conceptual innovation of type theory is just write out your free variables and say what type of thing they're, you're actually talking about when you have those free variables. Um, uh, so we also have variable types. So for example, what this expression down here says is that um, the tangent space at a point of a manifold M is a real vector space, given that M is a manifold and that P is a point on M. Okay, so, so just remember that the thing that the expression at the top says that B of X is an element of, of capital B of X, given that X is an element of A. Um, so we can form, uh, so I'm going to tell you now three different ways to form types. And this is just about all you need to do all of type theory. There's really, a, a, there's a few others that I'm not going to mention, but this is just about all you need, which is quite remarkable. Um, so first of all, we can form pairs. So uh, we have this type here, which is uh, the pair type, and its elements are pairs A comma B, where A is an element of A, and B is an element of capital B of A. So the, the type of little b can depend on the type of A. And so, for example, the total space of the tangent bundle is formed by these pairs. So it's a pair of a point on a manifold and a tangent vector to that point. So the type, what is that vector? It's a vector at that point that the type of that vector depends on the, the point that it's on. So it depends on the pair. The second element of the pair depends on the first one, the, the type of it. And the second one is a function type. And to give a function in type theory is very simple. We just say uh, that if we have, we can write down an element f of x, given that x is a, of type a, and, and f of x has the correct type, then we get an element. So here we have, note that this is a function where the codomain, the type of the codomain depends on the argument for the function. Um, and so this is something that both of these, I think, are, are sort of novel the first time you hear about them. But once you see them, you notice that they're just everywhere in normal mathematical parlance. We just, for some reason, they weren't emphasized in most formalizations. Um, this is one thing I love about type theory is these things just, once you learn to talk this way, it's just, oof, it's nice. So here you can see that if we have functions that takes an element of a, a manifold and gives a tangent vector at that manifold, uh, at, sorry, a, a tangent vector at that point, that's what we call a vector field. So you can see that this, uh, these dependent function types show up uh, as vector fields. So it's very useful to express this. Go on. So the real thing that makes this home Adobe type theory, quote unquote, um, is the types of identifications. And I'm not gonna explain how they work, they're wonderful and sleek, and there are actually now a number of different ways to, to do these, to formalize these. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not going to explain how any of them work. I'm just going to tell you that you can always understand it this way. If we have elements X and Y of a given type A, then we have a type of ways to identify X with Y. So for example, how do we identify two vector spaces? We give a linear isomorphism between them. So for example, to identify the tangent space of a manifold at a given point with Rn, we give coordinates at that point, right? To identify two manifolds, we give a diffeomorphism between them. Um, to identify two types, we will give an equivalence between them. So I'm not gonna explain what this is, but this is the famous univalence axiom. And in some systems of homotopy type theory, such as cubical type theory, um, you can actually prove this. Um, and uh, for, uh, for um, uh, so-called book homotopy type theory, um, you take it as an axiom. And from this axiom, you prove all the rest of this. So it's very, uh, so all of these are theorems, I should say. Um, and uh, in the natural numbers, however, how do you identify two natural numbers? Well, 
it's you just show that they're the same. You prove that they're the same. So it's a, they're, they have the type of how you identify them, the ways you can identify two natural numbers. It's just either you have one because they're the same number, um, uh, which is to say you just look at them and you're like, they're the same number. That's your way to identify them. Or you don't have any and it's an empty type. Um, so as you can see, the type of identifications here, I've used the equal sign. And this is important. The last example shows you that a special case of these identifications is traditional equality. And so this is a strict generalization of the notion of equality. Um, and so that's the way you should think of it. Identification is this generalization of equality. And one thing I wanna point out uh, really quick, I don't know if you can see this very well, but in the top corner here, I have a written out a definition and I, I just write this out in order to emphasize that any de mathematical definition can basically be written out with these three types already, uh, almost. Um, so this is the type of torsors for a group G. So a torsor is a, uh, is a set with an action of the group G um, that is free and transitive and inhabited. And as you can see here, what we have is a type, that's our underlying type, this thing says that it's a set. Uh, what a set means in, um, in uh, uh, homotopy type theory is that there's uh, at most one way to identify any two elements. Um, then we have this action of G, we have the axioms of the action, and you can see that they are function types, landing and identification types. And then we have, this is the, a big a function type, landing in a pair type with identification types. The point is that this whole definition just reads out the logical structure of the axioms. It's a uh, it's an action satisfying certain uh, laws and so on, but it's all built with these three type formulas I've already told you. So when I say something like take the type of all G actions, what I mean is something that looks like this. And so uh, it, it, the type itself tells you the definition. Okay. So here's uh, very briefly a dictionary. It's a, it's a long project of a lot of people, some, some of whom I've written up here to show that you can interpret homotopy type theory in sheaves of homotopy types. I'm not gonna really go into this too much. I think I wanna, wanna get a move on here. So I'm just gonna say that you interpret a type in context as a, as, a, uh, as a map into the interpretation of the base. And this is what gives homotopy type theory its power, this interpretation. It's, it's, it, it, uh, it's, it's that when you work in homotopy type theory, it looks like you're working point-wise, element-wise. But when you interpret it, you're actually working in these slice categories. So you get all these continuity properties you get from just being a, a sheaf on a certain site for free. It's like, wow, so super cool. Um, okay, just gonna go on. Oh, I, I'll say one thing, that the type of identifications gets interpreted as the diagonal, but since we're working in infinity category theory, we have to um, finally replace the diagonal. So, that, so what that's called is a path type, and that's how we pick up this homotopical structure in homotopy type theory. Let's say that really briefly. Okay, now I wanna talk about how higher, higher uh, groups work. So how groups work in homotopy type theory. So uh, one way we can think of a group is as, uh, as a uh, set of objects, um, a set of, uh, of, of operations with an action, with a multiplication and some laws. But the other way and the more primitive way is that we have some kind of object or some, some species of object. And we look at the symmetries of that, of that object or those objects. And those symmetries, right, naturally form a group because sort of you can compose symmetric operations. If a symmetry is, is an operation that leaves something unchanged, then, uh, uh, then you can just do one and then the other and that's your group operation. And so this is the point of view we're gonna take in homotopy type theory. We'll define a, in this case, a higher group because we're not asking that it be a set, but a, a higher group is just any type which is identified with the symmetries of some given canonical exemplar of the group. So this is the thing here. I, I've, I've chosen this terminology, canonical exemplar, point BG, and it's in some type BG, that's, I'll call that the type of exemplars of the group, uh, which is zero connected. And that means that there is somehow and a way to identify every exemplar with the canonical exemplar, although you might not have a specific choice. So to parse this uh, definition, let me give you some examples. For example, we could take the type of exemplars of the general linear group to be the type of vector spaces. So that a general linear group of n dimensions, we should take the type of n dimensional vector spaces. The canonical n dimensional vector spaces are n, and this gives us this. And then if, to check that in fact, 
we have given a so-called de-looping, this BG is sometimes referred to as a de-looping of the group G, of, of GLN. We check that the symmetries of RN when considered as a real vector space are in fact um, uh, GLN, which it is. And so for example, we can also take the exemplars of an N element set to be, uh, sorry, the exemplars of the symmetric group on N elements to be an N element set. And we will take our canonical N element set to be any, any one we wish. Here's my you know, prefixes of the natural numbers, prefix uh, of the natural numbers. Um, and the symmetries of this, yes, are in fact the symmetric group. Uh, so we can do all of group theory from this perspective. And it actually turns out to be really beautiful. Um, for a lot of that, you can see there's an upcoming book. I think it's mostly written by uh, Ulrich Buchholz um, called The Symmetry Book. And you can find it on, on GitHub. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, it's, um, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's aimed at undergraduates and it does this whole thing. So it's, uh, it's, it's in draft form right now, but it's quite readable. And, and so you can go ahead and check that out. Um, but the thing I need to say here is that a homomorphism isn't going to be interpreted as just a function, uh, that takes exemplars of, of the first group to exemplars of the second group in it, together with an identification of the image of the canonical exemplar with the canonical example of the second group. So for example, just simply, we can include the symmetric group into the general linear group by taking a finite set, which is an example of the symmetric group and giving the free vector space on it, which is an exemplar of the general linear group because it's an n-dimensional vector space. Um, and, and sort of by almost by definition, Rn is the free vector space on, on the standard n element set. Yep. Um, so, uh, so as a special case of this homomorphism thing, we can understand actions. So uh, the action of the unit circle on the complex plane, right? What we need to do is, so B ought uh, of the complex plane, I mean just all automorphisms of the complex plane, right? Because we're just gonna map U1 into the automorphism group of the complex plane. And so we need, to, we need to choose exemplars of this automorphism group. So we can just choose any type, which is somehow identifiable with the complex plane. So that's what we have, it's the types identifiable with the complex plane. And to de-loop the circle group, we can uh, uh, note that it's the symmetries of the complex plane when considered as a Hermitian uh, vector space. So we'll take it to be the one-dimensional Hermitian vector spaces. And now we can take the action really simple. It's the forgetful map. It's the one that takes a one-dimensional Hermitian vector space and just forgets all that structure. And so, um, and so uh, uh, what we see here is that if we like, you can see that what this does is if you take a symmetry of the complex plane um, when considered as a Hermitian vector space and then forget that you're considering it as a Hermitian vector space, that indeed is the traditional action of the circle group on the complex plane. This is rather trivial. Um, and the, the trick here to get these actions right is to always pick one where it's trivial. So I think I'll give an example of this here. Um, so let's try and give this action. This, this is gonna be a special case where I'm, I'm looking at something that sort of looks like um, the uh, billiard ball example. So uh, we're just gonna look at the top wall of the billiard table. So we're gonna give the C2 action on R2 that just flips top and bottom. So uh, we need to choose, so remember that the, 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 the motto here is that an action of a group on a type is equivalently given as a way of constructing types from the exemplars of that group. And exemplars of the group are things whose symmetries are that group, just to remind you. Um, that are uh, uh, constructing types, and I, I oh, I miss, a, I miss an important feature of this. The types B alpha E, um, we have to construct these, these uh, types from the exemplars of the group. And then we have to show that the canonical exemplar gets sent to something which we can identify we give a fixed identification of the image of the canonical exemplar with our type X. So in other words, we have to construct X out of the things that the group is the symmetries of. So I wanna give an example of that. Um, so let's give this action here. So this, the, the, the set we're acting on is the plane. So I need to construct the plane out of exemplars for the symmetric, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the cyclic group on two, on two elements. So, um, so now I have to choose exemplars for the cyclic group. So above I showed you, right, what the exemplars for the symmetric group could be. It could be two element sets. So to construct this action, I would have to build the plane out of two element sets. 
Well, we saw a way to do that before, right? We could send it to the three group on two element test, right? Um, but then if you think about what that does, that would send uh, the canonical two elements at zero, one to R2, identifying the first component with zero and the second component with one, right? Um, however, what is the action of sigma two on that? It actually permutes zero and one. So that would actually flip the axes. So that's the wrong action. That constructs the plane in a manner that if you look at the change of exemplar, what you get is in fact the symmetry of the plane that switches the axes. That's not what the one we want. We want the sign action. And so to do that, we'll come up with a different um, notion of exemplar for our group here. So instead of, of delooping C2 as B sigma two, the type of two element sets, we'll delupe it as B01, which is the type of one dimensional real inner product spaces. So the symmetries of R as a one dimensional real inner product space is O1, which is C2. And now we can take our one dimensional real product space. Um, we can uh, direct sum it with R and then we can take the underlying set. And now if we plug R in for E, we find that we get R2. And if we change R, if we act on R by its symmetries, we see that we precisely are changing that second component, which is what we want. We're flipping it around. So that's great. So now I can show you how to take the quotient. The quotient is really easy to take. This is one of the great things. The quotient is really easy to take once you've set up the action in this way, you just take the type of pairs. So the quotient here is, is just going to be pairs consisting of a one dimensional inner uh, real inner product space and an element of R O plus that thing. So uh, the quotient map itself sends a pair of elements X and Y in R2 to the, the, the pair R, um, and that pair of elements, right? Because R2 is our both of R already. Um, so the thing I want you to note is that we pick up extra identifications by doing this. And the reason is because an identification in a type of pairs is an identification of the first component and then an identification of the second component with respect to the first component. Because remember the second component of a pair might have a type that depends on what the first component is. So if you say that the two first two components, they, they are written differently, but we have an identification between them. Then to compare the other two, we have to pass one forward along that. So if we say that we're going to identify R with R, not trivially by noting that they're literally the same, but instead by flipping them around, which is a symmetry, right? Then we would have to identify X and Y, not with itself, X, Y, but with X and negative Y, which is where this gets sent. So we end up with this identification here, um, which you'll note is the one we wanted to have in a quotient. And another thing I'll note is that if you plug in zero for, uh, zero for Y, you'll see that this gives you an identification of, of X comma zero with itself. And so we ended up with those symmetries of the points on the boundary, just like we wanted these, these internal symmetries. And, and that doesn't come from taking, uh, we didn't make a, uh, that doesn't come sort of by remembering them by hand. It comes just because of their definition of the points of this type. So that's the thing I wanna emphasize here. So we can use this to build orbifolds. So for example, uh, way behind, talks way too long, sorry. <laughs> um, for example, uh, the moduli stack of elliptic curves um, we're, we can take a one-dimensional Hermitian vector space and a lattice in it. The curve, the elliptic curve itself, is the quotient of the vector space by the lattice, um, and uh, and that works. Um, and so we can also do. I have a configuration space and a cover surface here. I won't go over them. The universal cover of of the uh, moduli stack of elliptic curves is. Oh, I should say this as well. When you do interpret this as as sheets of homotopy types, which are also known as stacks, sometimes. Um, this does get interpreted, in fact, as the moduli stack of elliptic curves, which is good. Um, so the universal cover of this is the upper half plane. And we can describe this map really completely because remember, we just described this stack by saying what its points are, and that's it. No other structure, which is really cool. So if we take an element of the upper half plane, we can get a pair of a one-dimensional Hermitian vector space, namely the complex numbers, and a lattice in it, and we'll take the lattice generated by that point, which is intuitively what we were supposed to do anyway, right? Because the, the elliptic curve that's, that's given by this parameterization, this tau here, is the one that's given by modding out by this C by this lattice. So 
that's exactly what we want. And so one thing we can do here is we can calculate the homotopy type. So I've suggested that here, but I'm going to go on and give us a really brief homotopy theory of orbifolds. So one thing we can do with this is we can use modalities. So uh, I want to say that this uh, uh, we're going to use now the Mike Schulman's uh, cohesive homotopy type theory. So um, uh, a type is discrete if every path in it is constant. So every path being every, every map from the real line. And I will say that, that every function is continuous in, in our setting. So, uh, so we don't have to say every continuous function, it's just every function is constant. Um, and the shape is uh, the unique map, the universal map, sorry, the initial map from a type into a discrete type. So you can think of it as the quotient of a type by all its paths in it. Um, and that, uh, one way to think about that is that's the homotopy type of that type. So the shape is the homotopy type of the type. And so for example, if you take the circle and you take its shape, you'll get uh, BZ, a de-looping of, of, uh, of the integers, which is to say you'll get a type whose only has, uh, uh, so only one point up to identification the identifications of that point are precisely the integers of the group, um, which is what we expect the homotopy type of the circle to be. So we can calculate the shape of M11 very concretely. We can actually write down the action of this function into the homotopy type on points. I think this is really cool, personally. I like this. And so what we have to do is just be clever on how do we choose exemplars for the group. Uh, so, wait a I know beforehand because people have done the hard work of, of doing this normal way that it's going to turn out to be BSL two C. Now I could figure I, I I could figure that out without knowing that just by looking at the the universal cover I defined on the last one. But um, uh, instead, I'm just going to let me just go on. How do I delute this? Well, first let me talk about GLN GL two R right. GL two R is the type of real vector spaces. Uh, two-dimensional real vector spaces. If I want to cut that to GL to Z, then I can adjoin. I can say I want them to preserve a lattice because the uh, the uh, lattice preserving real vector spaces, right? Uh, two by two real vector spaces are going to be exactly the ones with integer coefficients because a lattice is a free group, uh, free abelian group on two generators um, embedded in here. And so if we pres preserve them effectively, we just have to have uh, we have to be sort of changing our basis of this free abelian group, and that's given by an integer matrix. Um, and then, if I want to cut that down so it's special, uh, I, I can ask that it pre uh, it, it preserves a, a non-degenerate um, form of the highest degree. So in this case, it's going to be a two form. So this is going to be by deluping of SL two Z. And now you can see that there's sort of an obvious map we can take, right? We, we, we go from something which is a vector space, of course, over the complex numbers, and a lattice in it. And we need to produce a vector space over the real numbers, a lattice in it, and then this two form. So what can we do? Well, we have one extra bit of structure on the left-hand side that we have on the right-hand side um, in terms of the vector space, which is this Hermitian product. And it's sort of a well-known fact that if you take the imaginary part of the, uh, it should be a negative imaginary, but it, that's, a that's a choice of convention or whatever. Um, if you take the uh, imaginary part of, of a Hermitian uh, 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 of, of a Hermitian um, inner product, you get a, uh, a symplectic structure, which is a non-degenerate two form. In that case, that's what exactly what we want. And so we can prove this with a little, a, a quick argument that actually turns out to be, it's not that quick. In fact, when you, <laughs> it turns out to rely on like some non trivial like you have to, you have to show that SL2R mod U1 is contractible, um, which traditionally you do by showing that it's actually equivalent to the upper half point. Um, and that that it's that's uh, it's involved, but it's standard. It's standard, and it's something that you could you could do in like a, a first class on this kind of thing. So it's very concrete. Um, and then showing that it's a general theory of modal. It's a general fact about modalities. The shape is an example of a modality in homotopy type theory. That um that this means that this is the shape unit is the the shape um, map up there. Uh, okay, I'm gonna rush on. Go boldly for. Uh, so I'm going to talk a really, really, really quickly about synthetic differential geometry. Synthetic differential geometry is a field which was uh, begun by Lebeer in the, in the 60s um, and developed by many people. 
um, including Dubu from Bonga and uh, uh, Kalk um, and uh, Reyes and uh, Mordike and many more, um, and uh, and Penal, um, uh, and Bergenau <laughs> up here. Um, and uh, so what it does is it axiomatizes the uh, the field of real numbers uh, with their smooth structure, um, and it has infinitesimal. So one thing is that uh, if we drop the law of excluded middle, if we drop double negation elimination, saying that if something is not uh, some that that not not of a proposition implies that it's true, then we end up with infinitesimals naturally. And this is an observation of Penon that um, that we can say a number is infinitesimal if it's not distinct from zero. And uh, and so it it turns out that in fact in the Dubu topos, uh, this is a theorem of Dubu and Penon that the numbers which are not not zero get in, get it when you plug them through the machine they turn into the representable on the germs of uh of functions at zero in the real numbers so they are in fact the infinitesimals in, in, in fact i mean they are the the representable sheep on the infinitesimals the the germs of functions at zero so i think that's really cool so so the axiom here the main axiom is is any function of a, of a number that squares to zero which in particular means it can't not be zero because we are in a field. So if it was not zero, it would, and it's squared to zero, we'd get a contradiction. We'd get that zero equals one. So if a number squares to zero, um, then any function of it is linear. Um, and we also have this extremely insane uh, axiom, which was noticed by uh, Levere, I believe, uh, uh, taking a, uh, a feature that was first identified by Bunga in, in her thesis for doing other things. And then, um, and then brought into uh, homotopy type theory here, which is that the, the exponential functor that is exponentiating by the set of infinitesimals um, uh, uh, is, uh, has, a, uh, has an external right adjoint. So this is not an internal right adjoint. And to handle that, we need this notion uh, that I haven't discussed at all from uh, Shulman's cohesive homotopy type theory known as crispness. So we can express this internally. And that's something I do. I do this in a slightly different way in my paper, which I think works a little better for homotopy type theory. Anyway, the main definition I need to get through really quickly here is what it means to be microlinear. And microlinearity is effectively the way of saying locally similar to R, except it's a really nice way of saying it. Uh, it's a lifting property is one way to think of it. But it says basically, if you have the square of infinitesimal varieties, and infinitesimal varieties are literally algebraic varieties whose every point is infinitesimal, um, uh, and it's a it's a, a bunch of pointed maps, so they all send zero to zero, um, so that if you map into R, you get a pullback. In other words, a way to think of this is that R thinks that this square is a pushout, right? Then X also thinks this square is a pushout, and when you map into X, you also get a pullback. And this turns out to imply that, for example, the functions from the nil square infinitesimals into x um, that send n zero to a fixed point form an R module, which is to say the tangent spaces of x form R module. So that's one way of saying that x is smooth. Um, that this includes all manifolds. It also includes all function spaces between manifolds. So this is a great simple generalization of that. Um, so. Uh, the the we can now use more modality theory here um we can use a bit more modality theory to uh uh to show uh to give a notion of a tall maps we can actually prove that this formal notion of a tall map corresponds in fact to regular old local diffeomorphisms when you are going between regular old manifolds um and uh we can prove a little uh sort of descent theorem for microlinearity along these maps and using that and using the fact that we uh, that, that, that quotienting by a discrete group is in fact a covering map, which is a purely modal fact, we can get that uh, the good orbifolds are, um, are uh, in fact microlinear as long as they're the quotients of things that are microlinear. So if you take a manifold, you quotient out by a discrete group, you get something microlinear, which is cool because it's not a set. So this is something that wasn't, it's not, uh, it's a, not a sheaf of sets, it's a sheaf of groupoids or or more. So, um, so this is something that was not touched on by traditional synthetic differential geometry. And to get all the proper tau group points, you really need this more complicated descent theorem, which I'm not going to cover. So David, this is wonderful, but we should move to wrap yeah. up in the next five minutes. Thanks. Great. Uh, uh, I can wrap up real quickly. 
Uh, I guess uh, so. There's some things I haven't covered is notions of finiteness. So the uh, Buchbinon compactness gets some nice play here. The tiny infinitesimals and form classifiers you can define out of uh, out of them. This is stuff that has been known, but I don't think it's ever been done internally because it requires Shulman's uh, crisp type theory to do, or maybe other ones. I would love to give a challenge to type theorists to get get tiny objects working really well. Please do it. Um, and differential cohomology is, is sort of the, the end goal here is to get differential cohomology of orbitals in order to do, uh, to do um, sort of the, some good things with uh, topological quantum computing. Um, so my, my future work here, I want to work with uh, Greg Langsmead to construct connection classifiers. So I have the basic idea of it, but the, uh, now it comes down to just, just, just proving that it works. So the, the construction, again, is just this kind of cool pair thing, but it, I'm not gonna be able to go into it, but it really, really like kind of directly says that a uh, a connection on a principal bundle is is an equivariant form on the total space, um, and uh, uh, and I, I think I noticed that uh, Ingo Bletchman's in the audience here, so I'd just like to say I'd, I'd love to see if these similar definitions, and I, I think they would would work for Dilly Mumford stacks if you did it in an algebraic setting using his axioms. So thank you very much. Sorry for going over here. Um, Thanks, David. That was great. Yeah, so maybe we should take a few questions before we wrap up and like move to discussion or something. So I saw that anyone in the audience wants to raise their hand. I also see that there are some questions in the chat here that you might want to answer, David. Um, if you could see those. Uh, yeah, let me check them out. Uh, what's a homotopy quotient versus a quotient? This is a great question that I should have really uh, explained at the time. Um, so a quotient, you just say, I'm going to take these two points, one gets to the other on this group action, and I'm going to say they are equal, done, right? A homotopy quotient says, I'm going to say that I will identify this one with this one because this group element sent one to the other. So it's a way of, of doing a quotient that remembers why they are identified. So it ends up with extra data. And, and traditionally, this was done by literally adjoining a continuous path between things in a topological space, then quotienting out by homotopy. That's why it's called a homotopy quotient. But in fact, the idea has nothing to do with homotopy whatsoever. Um, OK. Uh, there's a sense in which, to the next question, that there's this, it, the, the difference between, say, some set foundations and, and hot foundations is that variable is a primitive concept. This is something that's shared by all type theories versus first order logic. Um, variable is a meta concept in first order logic. It's also a meta concept in type theories, but they just do them differently. Like in, in first order logic, you can do first order logic using in this hygienic way. Um, uh, and I think it's actually very good for pedagogy. But usually, if you look at it, you'll see that someone says, let's define the free variables of a formula. And, and then you work instead of saying that you can only form this kind of formula within this kind of context. It's sort of a different way of thinking. It's, it's subtle, but it's, it's like, yeah. but it's not something particular about homotopy type theory. Okay. Well, what prompted me to ask the question is can we discuss the, the difference between a constant and a variable in type yes. theory? Yes. So uh, maybe if I rush back up uh, so we can see it uh, there. Yeah. So uh, if I'm up here, right, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, uh, the difference is a constant would have nothing behind the turnstile. So, so for example, zero is a natural number. There's no variables, right? No free variables. So that's a constant natural number. And, and that's really the difference between a constant and a variable. Uh, a constant has no free variables in it. It's an expression with no free variables. Um, and that's it. So in fact, you can prove uh, in a precise sense that the only constant in, um, in uh, the, the only constant infinitesimal is zero, which is this great, I think, validation of Newton's intuition that, that infinitesimals are, are uh, quantities in flux. Um, uh, Okay. Okay. Um, Great. So um, let's thank the speaker again. Oh, I have a question. Oh, well, we'll, we'll have a yeah, we're going to. Thank you all. Ended the live stream there. So now we're just 